How you doing, Josh? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I really appreciate you you taking us up on on the invitation that we had, cool. bringing you in, and uh, a Sierra alumni, another Sierra alum, alumni is is in the house. Yeah, we're we're crawling out of the woodwork at this point. Well, tell us a little bit as to what you've done, not only just in Sierra, but in your professional career. Well, um, I started off as a stand-up comic, which uh, served me really well when I got to Sierra and I was writing on things like Leisure Suit Larry. Uh, when I was at Sierra, I worked on Leisure Suit Larry games. I worked on Laura Bow. Uh, I worked on Space Quest IV. Uh, did documentation on Space Quest V and then, of course, Space Quest VI. Um, uh, God, what else? Oh, Freddie Farkas, a little thing called Freddie Farkas uh, with Al Lowe. I love working with Al. I've worked with him a lot over the years. And then after Sierra, I went to Legend Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And Legend did fantastic adventure games, really very literary. Uh, the designs were very tight. They had a very rigorous um, review process for designs. So you didn't get illogical puzzles. You didn't get dead ends. Uh, it, was, it was really uh, a pleasure to work with those guys. Uh, Bob Bates and Mike Verdu uh, headed up the company. And that's, uh, I worked on uh, Shannara with uh, Corey and Lori Cole. And then I did Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, uh, which was based on uh, short stories by Spider Robinson. Excuse me. And after uh, Legend, I went uh, freelance and I worked for Broderbund. I worked for Microsoft. Um, I'm trying to think if I did anything substantive for Surtech. I don't think I did. I think they were they were already falling off the rails by that time. Um, and then I went to Vicarious Visions and I did several games at Vicarious Visions before they were bought up by Activision. And since then, I worked on, I worked uh, briefly on the Sam and Max VR game uh, for the uh, Oculus Quest. And uh, most recently, Foolish Mortals with David Younger. Oh, man. So that's all that brings you up to date. You know what? Many, uh, many, a few, quite a few people that I've talked to you have called you the unsung hero of Sierra and the adventure game industry. Now you're, now you're coming out with, or you're helping with Foolish Mortals as well, which is another game that I'm very, very excited to know you were working with that. I didn't either. Yes, I did, uh, I did dialogue with them. I'm, my part is done at this point, um, but uh, I worked on, on dialogue, especially for uh, the first act of the game where we wanted to establish the characters' voices, and so on, um, and it's it's turning out beautiful. The demo just came out, and I think the animation is breathtaking. It's so smooth and fluid and mm. gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely. And so you, as you mentioned, you started Space Quest One, correct? Or not? I'm no. sorry, Space Quest Six. Yes. You started uh, Space started Quest Six, and right uh, with Scott. With Scott, um, yes. I mean, I didn't. I didn't write a single word of the SQ Six design document without <laughs> first sending it to Scott, because I wanted him involved. Um, I, I I wanted the game to be at least half, uh, you know, a guy from Andromeda. Um, I don't mean half a guy from Andromeda. I mean, never mind. Uh, uh, yeah. That's I part of the comedy that Quest. you threw in there. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm here all week. Um, uh, I, I got uh, pretty far with the uh, Space Quest Six design, and I, I did quite a bit of uh, text, text and dialogue writing. Uh, and then I ended up leaving the company um, the political uh, standing of the company had just deteriorated so much. 
And I never knew from one week to the next who my boss was going to be, um, how the teams were going to be arranged, um, who I was going to be working with next and needed to get ready to, to start thinking about. It just, it just was all falling apart around me. And I couldn't really work very well under those circumstances. I needed, I needed some stability. What artists uh, could? Yeah. Well, you know, the guys put the game out, and it, it certainly may have its flaws, but uh, there are some things I think it does really well, some things that I think were really funny in it, and um, somehow they, they muddled through with all the chaos that was going on at the company at the time. So you're a, a known voice actor for a lot of these games. How did you actually get into the voice a voice acting side of it? Well, uh, I had gone to school for uh, acting. Mm -hmm. I was a theater major at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, I had done a few commercials um, a couple of voiceovers, uh, some radio ads, uh, while I was working in the advertising industry. And then when I got to Sierra at one point, they said, we're going to hold auditions for King's Quest V. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a good opportunity. I'll, I'll try out for that. So I tried out and I, I, I was able to do this, this super buff voice that, um, Roberta and Mark Siebert really seemed to want, and um, and I could scream really loud when I'm falling off a cliff. You needed so, to. Yeah. You got a lot of practice in that. <laughs> I did, and it really frightened uh, some of the people in the in the building um, when I was doing that. They were poking their heads around to see what in the world the problem was and why someone was screaming bloody murder in the in the voiceover booth. So Josh, I'd love to hear more about uh, the, the stand-up comedy career. I, I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. I, oh. I think I knew that, but I'd forgotten. So, like, how long did you do that? And have you kept up with it at all? No, I haven't. Um, I started uh, in about 1980. Well, actually, it was before 1980 with some of the uh, other uh, members of the theater department uh, in Madison, uh, we formed a little improv group as everyone was doing back then. And we were actually the new improv group on the block. The former improv group was um, Kentucky Fried Theater, which uh, went on to make uh, the Airplane movies and Top Secret and Kentucky Fried Movie. Um, and some of the guys from, from Kentucky Fried Theater were our TAs uh, in the theater department. So we started this improv group and uh, eventually everyone graduated, moved away, but this one woman, Karen, uh, Karen McVeigh and I were left. And we started doing two-person sketches out on the student mall um, at the student union uh, getting a little extra money that way. And then I graduated in 1981 and I thought, I'm gonna go to Chicago and see if I can get into Second City. Yeah. And Karen said, I got nothing else to do, I'll move with you. So she moved with me to, to Chicago and we immediately started working comedy clubs and did that, uh, ended up doing that for about four years we toured uh, all over the Northwest and a little bit in Canada. Um, we played all together something like 150 clubs and colleges. Uh, we were headlining by time we stopped. And the only reason we stopped was because Karen, uh, who was married uh, at the time, got pregnant. And this was back in the 80s when you could smoke all you wanted to in comedy clubs and nightclubs and, yeah. and so on. And he finally said, I, I hate to do this to you, but I can't be spending five nights a week, six nights a week in these comedy clubs, breathing yeah. this smoke. 
Uh, and I, I couldn't really blame her. I mean, I was, I was devastated, but yeah. I, I, of course, saw the, the wisdom of her decision. And so we stopped uh, working together, uh, except now and then. And we actually reunited uh, to do a show at Sierra for their Christmas party. Right. And that turned out to be a, a kind of a turning point for me because up until then I had just sort of been assistant producer or junior producer to uh, Garuka Singh Khalsa. And after we got off stage, Ken Williams came up to me and he said, you know, you're a funny kind of guy. You funny, could be yeah. designing these games. <laughs> and I was like, I would love to. I mean, I didn't want to say that's the whole reason I came here, but uh, <laughs> it really was. Josh. Oh. Oh, no, please go for it. Okay. I'm glad Jack brought up your, your uh, comedy career because I wanted to, uh, maybe this is an obvious sort of question. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm interested to know the process, say, going from developing comedy as stand up to developing comedy in a fixed sort of format. Because I, I sort of think of stand up as being, you know, having a dynamism that sort of, writing down comedy or, or, you know, going into a different medium, say, is there some sort of difference in the process there? I mean, is it significantly different, not as different as you might think, or you know, what, what is, is there a process difference? And if there is, what, what is it? Um, I found it quite similar. In fact, uh, I sort of looked at game design as a way to continue to do comedy. Uh, just without a live audience. Um, and so I did a, I started writing and I was, I was just turning on my comedy brain and, and writing uh, jokes as I would tell them if I was on stage. Uh, we used to do a lot in our act of fake commercials, uh, commercial parodies. And uh, so one of the very first assignments I had after I did uh, King's Quest One SCI was to write the bargain bin boxes in Space Quest Four, uh, the fake games, and that was just it was almost exactly like writing a commercial parody. Explain so that. I always found it kind of similar. Uh, maybe I don't know the what the reference the bargain bin boxes like. Help, help me oh. out with that. Um, in Space Quest IV, uh, there is a mall, the Galaxy Galleria. Gotcha. And there's a store called, I believe it's Radio Shock. And you go into Radio Shock, and there's uh, a bin. And you can look in the bin and see all these game boxes, which you can then shift around, because you're looking specifically for the Space Quest IV hint book which is also in the bargain bin. And the bargain bin had games in it like, uh, all of them were parodies of existing big games. Like there was, it came for dessert. Uh, King's <laughs> Quest 28, the, the quest for disc space. Uh, <laughs> boom, instead of loom. Where in, where in the world is Jaime Lipschitz? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I didn't come up with the titles for these. Mark Crow uh, and maybe Scott, I'm not sure, um, had already come up with the titles and the artwork, but they're like, we need descriptions for them. So I got to write these very sarcastic descriptions <laughs> of these games. Uh, and Brian Moriarty once took issue with what I had written about Boom which was making fun of how I don't want to say easy Loom was because it wasn't easy, but how you couldn't really fail at it, and that that was the whole uh, the whole Lucas Arts thing with not being able to die and so on. And I sort of poked fun poked fun at that. So there's a whole bunch of boxes in there. There was um, uh, I think it was called Checkerboard Simulator something like that. And it was like, you get all these tiles, red and black, and you can arrange them in any way you want, as long as they're 
alternating. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there was Sim Sim. Um, it's not a simulation. It's a simulation of a simulation. A simulation. That's right. I feel like Space Quest was just made to take advantage of all these incredible pop culture references and just slam them what? in and make you laugh the whole way through. And in, yeah. a, in a lot of ways, Freddie Farkas as well. You wrote you wrote the theme song for that. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, Al, Al was. Uh... Uh, a little reluctant. I told him I wanted to do a bouncing ball ballad because we had all this backstory and we needed a, a way to present it. And we could have done just a standard opening cinematic of some sort, but I thought a bouncing ball ballad would be really cool. And he said, well, I don't know if you're going to be able to do that, but you can certainly give it a try. So uh, I wrote it and the closing ballad and the programmers, God love them, were somehow able to coordinate the bouncing ball with the uh, the lyrics to the song, uh, and it worked. It worked really well, I thought. I could. I will second that. My wife and I we we own a, an improv comedy club, and you got to come over. Come out. Come out of retirement. Come on over and let's do a, we'll do a, a parody based off uh, Sierra games. I mean, that would kill. That would kill. Now I'm sweating. Now I'm, I'm in, I'm having cold sweats. <laughs> it's like riding a bike. Come on. Everybody has a little bit of sweat. So I'm still sweating and I've been now into this, what, nine hours into this, into this <laughs> podcast? Yeah, I bet. I even peed myself a little, apparently. <laughs> Just thinking about it. <laughs> Don't think about it too hard. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so at where least, where are you? That you have this comedy club. We're in Springfield, Missouri. They're right in the middle of the country, and uh, not that I'm proud of it. I'm, but uh, my my wife was raised in Chicago. I was raised in Southern California. Somehow we came together here in the middle of the country and and slowed our life down a little bit. And so we have a, a lot of a lot of fun with that. I got to ask you, you're a known big Space Quest fan. What is your favorite Space Quest game? Space Quest Three. Oh. Okay. Next question. First things off the top yeah. of your head. Your your favorite Space Quest villain? Oh, Sludge. Your go home. your least favorite Space Quest villain? Someone you just want to punch in the throat, paying homage to the game we talked about earlier. Torpe. <laughs> what is it? Oh, Charpe, of course. Torpe, the villain from Space Quest Six. Of course. Okay, there you go. So, and who who designed the battleship uh, puzzles in in Space Quest? Was it Five? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. That was all dynamics. Space Quest V was done entirely at dynamics. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Mark, you know Crow, Mark Crow had transferred from mm -hmm. Oakhurst to uh, Eugene, Oregon, where dynamics was. And Ken wanted dynamics to do Space Quest. He wanted them to, to get into adventure games. Space Quest historian literally just told us that on our, on our podcast. And yet I... Uh, I... I, I, I forgot about that. That's one thing I hated about Space Quest. That stupid battleship game that you had to be able to, to, to beat. And, and at least you got to beat somebody that we truly, truly didn't like. I loved Space Quest V. I mean, people, people sometimes say, and the Space Quest historian is one of them, mm -hmm. who say, oh, you took all the characters, all the great characters from Space Quest V and threw them out uh, for Space Quest VI. And it wasn't that I didn't like them. Uh, I loved them, and I loved the game, except for the maze uh, at the end. But uh, I, I just sort of felt that Roger was better off as a loser uh, to, to not be in command of a ship. It seemed odd. And so the scene at the beginning of Space Quest VI where Roger is busted back down to janitor is supposed to mirror the sequence from Star Trek. Oh, which Star Trek movie was it where 
they hauled Kirk up in front of Starfleet and they busted him back down to captain or something from Admiral. It was supposed to be a direct correlation to that. Gotcha. Yeah, I think it was the end of number four. Saved the world, but he got demoted. Well, I mean, but did 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 he really even earn being a captain anyways? Come on, he fell butt backwards into <laughs> success, and uh, he also cheated. So, you know, <laughs> bring him back down where he belongs, right? We love, the, we love that guy, where he is. I'm sorry, I missed that. Everything froze for a second. What'd you say? Oh, gosh. I Joshua I... was just bad-mouthing Captain Kirk. No, oh. no, I was talking about Ro- Roger Wilco, how he oh. was, he he fell he fell ass backwards oh, Roger. success, oh, okay. and he cheated his way. I thought we were going to have fighting words there about Trek, but uh, okay. No, no, Captain Kirk, he earned his he earned everything that he got. But okay. Roger, we liked him as the lovable loser, the guy who yes. sleeps in the broom closet. So why not bring him back down to size? He cheated. He cheated. That was my thought. Now, you're probably best known for your Sierra stuff, um, mainly because Legend never gets as much, uh, you know, accolades as it deserves. I mean, just an extraordinarily amazing company. They always produce great games, one of which uh, was Callahan's Cross Time Saloon. So kudos to you for all your work there. Well, you can you tell us a little bit about your time working for Legend? Well, when I first got to Legend... They wanted me to design a game based on Robert Edding's Belgariad series, a series of fantasy novels. And so I spent several months reading all the books and designing a game. And, uh, oh, did Jack just uh, drop out? Well, they'll be back. Okay. Uh, uh, So I spent months designing this game, and then it was presented to Robert Eddings to get his approval. And Robert Eddings took one look at it and said, I don't want a video game version of my universe. I don't want kids jumping and running and punching uh, in my universe. And it was clear that his conception of computer games really came from like, Mario or yeah. uh, something like that. There was no running, jumping, and punching in my design. But he was immediately turned off. And the publisher, which was not Legend. Legend didn't publish its own games. They, they usually uh, right, yeah. worked with like Random House or, or another major publisher. They backed away really quickly. And they said to me, all right why don't you suggest to us two authors whose works you would be interested in turning into a game? And I had been reading the Spider Robinson novels for quite a while, and I said, there's two. I said, I'd be interested in Spider Robinson's Callahan series, and I'd be interested in doing something with Dean Koontz. And they immediately said, Spider Robinson. Now, I don't know if they had some particular reason to steer me away from Dean Koontz, but I was more than happy to work on the Callahan's series. And I tried to work with Spider sort of closely, but that didn't work out because Spider, as it turns out, was really only primarily interested in making sure that the checks cleared. Okay. So I did insist on running the plots <clears throat> the plots of the sub stories by him to make sure they were in line with what he saw as possible in his universe and for the most part he said yeah that sounds great go with it the one uh sub adventure <clears throat> that I came up with that he Next was an origin story for the character Doc Webster, who is a, a character in all the short stories. And he said, it's, it's a perfectly reasonable origin story for Doc Webster, but in my next book, 
I have an origin story for Doc Webster, so you can't do that one. Originally, I had wanted Callahan's to sub, uh, to consist of 10 individual stories all tied together at the bar, but for budgetary reasons and time reasons, we had to pare it down to six, but even so, that, that worked for me. That sort of like formed a pyramid where you could do any of the first three in any order, and then once you finished all three, you could do the second two in either order, and then you you were directed directly into the last story. Uh, and it, it was a pleasure. I, it was very hard working with those guys because at, at Sierra, it was very seat of the pants. You designed something, there was no one looking over your shoulder to say, well, but what about this? Have you thought about this? Do you have a dead end here? You had to think of all that yourself or hope the QA identified these problems. There was no structure for the designers. At Legend, it was just the opposite. Several times during the course of each game, almost the entire company would gather in the boardroom and you would go through your design step by step by step. And everybody in the room was free to comment, to criticize, to pick apart, uh, to make suggestions, anything like that. So it was a, a much more rigorous and emotionally fraught exercise to design at Legend. But I think the quality of the games there speaks for itself. Exactly. It's no no arguing with the results. Do you think that like sharpened your, not necessarily your abilities, but your focus or, you know, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Uh, when when I've worked on any game ever since then, there's one designer at, at Legend that I owe a great debt of gratitude to. His name is Glenn Dahlgren, and he did uh, Death Gate and Wheel of Time. Oh, yeah. At Legend. And he was very very firm about his rules for design and in how you hint at clues and the the rigor with which you have to ensure that the clues to the puzzles are always available to the player and so on and i have carried some of those lessons with me ever since and do you think oh please mm -hmm. okay um, do you think, again, maybe this is just an obvious question, but I'm, I'm interested in like the process of this. Do you think that you prefer a, a more freewheeling sort of process or a rigorous process of legend? Great question. Wow. Oh, that's, that's tough. Uh, on one hand, I love the freedom to do whatever I want to do. I mean, how can you argue with that? I don't like publishers looking over my shoulder. Uh, on the other hand, when you, when you have as much discipline as legend called for, I think you end up with a superior project, uh, product. So I would like to take the freedom with which Sierra created its games and apply Legends standards to them. In other words, he doesn't want to give you the real answer. That's a hybrid answer. <laughs> Josh, it's, it's, one thing I I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, one thing it's I respect all, about you is you're, of another. you're truly a fan, and it's so obvious in the way that you talk about the games, not only that you didn't play, but the games that you built. I'd love to have you on our, our podcast uh, shortly, and I'd like to talk to you about that afterwards. But right now, look at that. We have this lovely gentleman coming in here. You Robert. know, Robert? Or oh, yeah. Who's he talking about? <laughs> hey, Josh. Hi, Robert. How are you, man? Good to see you. Happy belated birthday, by the way. Thank you. Oh, wow. You. So, 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 50? 
Go with it, Josh. Take yeah, it. Yeah. I'm a comedian, right? Ah. Josh, it was such You're a pleasure having my you, wife my over friend. here. 64. I like it. I like it. And you know, a, a mere child. 64 years young. <laughs> I I see I see the uh, the the soapbox to Robert. Back into event staging. They'll is, is the orchestra going to play you <laughs> off or anything? Or... I hope so. We'll, we'll play the we'll play the Freddie Farkas song on his way out. There you go. And Excellent. also, Casey, we want to thank you for taking up all, giving yeah. us all of your time, my friend. Oh, absolutely. Very I, talented writer. Look I, look out for him more on the on the site. Thank you.